Boy, you know, I just, I, I, I want to just kind of call back and reiterate and thank Stacy for sharing your story. It's not always easy to share, um, but, but when you've seen what Christ does, it, 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 there's something inside of you that just, that just wants to, and, um, and, and there's nothing, there's, there's no better, uh, there's nothing better than, than the power of a changed life. And, and so as we see that, we know that God is doing incredibly powerful things in people's lives. And you know, as we're here this morning and get to enjoy this, I, I, I do want to take a minute and just remind us of a couple things. Because, you know, on one side, we could sit here and go, whoo, we're inside, you know, and we could, we could kind of mistakenly assume that, you know, everything's just kind of back to normal and it's not, right? Um, we, we, we still want to deeply care for each other. One, one of the things that I think out of this whole thing um, over the last six, eight months that, that we're really learning is, is that we really have to continue to do a better job of caring for each other. You know, when, when everything starts, we, everybody's kind of gung-ho, we're, caring, we're visiting our neighbors, and, and then as things drag on, we, we kind of, you know, everybody kind of shrinks in, and it gets hard, and it's tiring, and it is, and, but, but we, I think coming out, there's so many lessons that we need to learn. And, and there's a lot of lessons that we need to learn about just how we love and demonstrate love and respect for one another. And, 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 and I love seeing all the people, and even though people are spread out and things like that. And, and, and we want to just remind ourselves that we want to demonstrate to the best of our ability the love and, and the care of Jesus Christ to each other. And as people come in, you know, uh, we, we just want to say to everybody, you know, we, we're, we're ready when, when you are. We know that different people will be at different places. And you know what? As you come in, as you sit down, whether it's here or on the patio, wherever it is, and, and if there's ever a time when, you know, because people will come in and if somebody comes in and they come in and they sit too close. I, I kind of like this. It's been a while, so some of you are sitting in different seats, kind of because your row got closed today, right? <laughs> Hey, not, we're going to have to do that kind of thing more often, right? Just get me. But you know what? If you're ever in a place where you're uncomfortable, don't, don't ever feel bad about saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to move. I'm going to go. I'm going to do somewhere else. And if you're somebody and somebody moves away from you, don't think they hate you. Okay? Just realize that we, we're all in this together and, and we have to, we just have to love one another and, and, and respect one another and demonstrate that. And so we, you know, and, and no judging, you know, as people are out and about, you know, and someone's wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, you know, I, I get it, but, and we want to be careful and we want to be safe and respect one another. That, that, that is the key because it's a way that we can show love to each other. Um, but, but I'm just excited to have you in here today. And, and it's a joy it's, it's really a joy to, to be together. Today we're going to wrap up our series uh, called My Big Fat Mouth. Um, anybody have a big fat mouth in the room? Anybody? Yeah? People out on the patio? Yeah, at home. Thank you out there on the patio. Uh, thank you at home, even though I can't see you. On, because we all do. We, we all in some way, shape, or form have a big fat mouth. And remember, the title is My Big Fat Mouth, Not Their Big Fat Mouth. Okay? So during the message, there's none of that, you know. Um, no pointing at people across the room or, you know, no, 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 you know, on the way home saying, yeah, did you listen to the pastor? Okay. It's, it's not their big fat mouth. It's your big fat mouth. And we all need to work on it. You know why? Because every single one of us have said something. We've all said something in anger. We've all said something in confusion. We've all said something without thinking or maybe, maybe you were thinking just fine but you wanted to hurt that person. And, and the handiest tool that you had in your arsenal was words. And so you took aim and with, with your tongue, you pulled the trigger and your words shot out like a bullet. And later you wished you could have taken those things back, but you can't. And so we wanna get ahead of the game and learn how to use our words to bless and to not curse. And every single one of us have had words that were spoken to us, about us, over us, around us. And those words continue to ring over and over in our heads, telling us things like, 
you'll never measure up, your sins won't be forgiven, you know, that, that, that there's nothing special about you, that you're not enough, maybe even you're not loved. And folks, that is the furthest thing from the truth, but those things rattle around in our heads. And today I want you to know that Jesus wants to take those words from you, and he wants to carry your burden. Why does this happen? Well, quite simply, because we've all been hurt and hurt people hurt people. I mean, words, words aren't cheap, right? Words are actually free. But it's how you use them that will cost you in some way, shape, or form. They might cost you a relationship. They might cost you a job. They might cost you years of regret. They might cost you years of counseling. They will cost you. And so we need to be careful about how we use our words. And that's why in a very, very divisive and I dare I say toxic environment that we're in, you know, especially with all the politics going on, we have to be careful about how we use our words. Because how we use our words, what comes out of our mouth says so much about us. Just a quick overview of kind of where we've been. Week one, we, we said this in Proverbs 18, 21, says the tongue has the power of life and death. I mean, folks, that, that's serious, okay? It's not just like the tongue has the power to kind of, you know, make somebody feel a little bad or what. No, the tongue has the power of life and death. We're going to talk hopefully a lot more this morning about how to bring life using our, our mouths. But it has that kind of power. And anything that has that kind of power needs to be respected and it needs to be taken care of. Okay? We don't want to just let it out and let it loose because it has a power of life and death. Then in the second week, we, we talked about how we need to be quick to what? Yes, listen. See, you were listening. Good job, right? Quick to listen and slow to? See, now everybody wants to play, right? right? Slow to speak, right? How many of you have fouled that up and got that all backwards a few times, right? Where you were just fast to speak and then you didn't listen, and then you had to dig out, right? Happens to all of us. You know, in fact, I, I love, one of my, as I've been studying this, one of my favorite verses, I don't know why, it just makes me chuckle, comes from Proverbs chapter 10, 19, and it says this. It says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. And I'm like, if we could just like all follow that one for a while, everything would be good, Right? So, and then in, in the, excuse me, our third week, we, we found out uh, the tongue cannot be tamed. It, it actually tells us that no one can tame the tongue. I mean, that, that is huge. I mean, uh, even, so if you're here this morning and you're like, oh, I got this down. I got my tongue taken care of. The Bible would beg to differ. The, the Bible says, in fact, just when you think you got it, beware. Just when you think you got this figured out, oh, I can rest because I, I pretty much got it. No, the Bible says no one can tame the tongue. Then last week we talked about how the Apostle Paul, he told us don't let any unwholesome, okay, and that word meant rotten, don't let any rotten, don't let any death, you know, junk that's just dying in there and smells bad, don't let that stuff come out of your mouth. He says, but only what will build each other up. And those first weeks, it just seems like there's so much, there's so much that's just like hard and there's so much like, how are we going to do this? And there's so much like, oh, our tongues are, yeah. And this morning we want to kind of turn a page on this and, and kind of bring some really good news into this and, and talk about how we can use our tongues to bless people. You see, it's so important because what, one of the things that we, we ultimately hear in this, in, in, as we're studying this, uh, you know, these verses about our tongues, is what Jesus told us in Luke 6.45. And he said this, he says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things out of the treasury of an evil heart. And then listen to this, he says, what you say, what you say flows from what's in your heart. So the words that come out of your mouth are a barometer for the condition of your heart. 
And, and, and this is so important because um, we had a great illustration of this. Um, Brenda told me I, I could use this. In fact, she actually suggested it. Thank you, hon. Um, year, years ago, how many, how many of you have ever, like, you're on your way to church, um, but the kids are crazy, and you find yourself just angry at the kids while you're even, like, on your way to church, right? You're like, dear Lord Jesus, we need to get to church because if we don't, I'm going to kill these kids soon, right? So... Um, one morning, we're, we're on the way to church, and, um, and the ki- I don't even know what the kids are doing, and all of a sudden, and this happens j- very rarely, but all of a sudden, Brenda, I see that look in her eye, and I'm scared. I'm thinking, I better pull over, <laughs> you know, and, um, and I'm, you know, I'm like, well, I, I, I don't think I did anything. She turns and the kids are in the back, so I think they were fighting here, arguing, and she turns, and she's just like, you girls, you know, and all of a sudden, our daughter Hillary, if you know Hillary, there's always a song coming out of Hillary, and we, Brenda's like, you girls, da, da, da. and Hillary just starts singing the song that we all learned in Sunday school. Hillary starts singing, when Jesus lives in mommy's heart, happy is the home. <laughs> <laughs> and Brenda stopped, <laughs> and we all laughed, but truer words have never been spoken, right? When Jesus lives in mommy's heart and daddy's heart in the kids' hearts, when Jesus lives in our hearts, then the home is, is a happy, life-giving place. But when the things of the world, when everything creeps in, and we allow things like anger and bitterness to sit, then the things that come out of our mouths are not life-giving. They're life-defeating. And, and, and so, you know, we want our words to bring life, not death. We want to be better listeners. How many of you would like to be a better listener? Yeah. I read something this week. I know I'm not on the listen week, but I read it this week, so I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, Somebody said one thing to do to really help you learn to listen better um, is to take three minutes, set your alarm at just a whatever time in the day, and take three minutes to sit somewhere in total silence just listening to your surroundings on purpose. To not say anything, just three minutes to just be quiet and listen, because it will help us learn to listen better. We want to be better listeners. We we want to tame our tongues, even though the Bible says, man, nobody can do it. We want to build others up with the words, but how? Okay, it's not just by trying harder. It's not just by, you know, oh, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to be better at this, because that's the fallacy uh, of how we go about the Christian life. It's not just by your own strength. It's not by doing better or doing more or doing, you know, because if so, you're trying to do it by your power and that never works. We're just saying it's in Christ's power alone. So how do we do this? It's by allowing Jesus, it's Jesus to come into and to work on our stubborn, selfish hearts. That is how we fix our tongues. And God wants to use our lives and he wants to use our words to bless other people. God has always been about blessing people. There's a lot of people in our world today, um, I think I know where some of them get it, but um, a lot of people in the world today that think God is just this judge that just wants to like zap everybody and tell us what we can't do and he's the, you know, the cosmic killjoy and all this other stuff. That is not true. God wants to bless us. Jesus came and said, I want to give you life and life abundantly. You want, I want to give you life to the fullest. And, and, and Jesus wants to, he's always been about blessing from the very beginning. I mean, if you go all the way back to the book of Genesis, in the beginning, you know, when he started working with a guy named Abraham, he started working with Abraham and he, he, listen to what he tells Abraham, okay? Thousands of years ago, okay? Right there in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, he says this to Abraham, he says, If you will listen to me, Abraham, if you'll do what I ask you, he says, I will make you into a great nation and I will what? Bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will 
bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be what? I love this passage. It says, you know, it doesn't just say all the people of the world will be nice because of you. All the people of the world will, it says all the people of the world are going to be blessed. God has always been about blessing people and then using blessed people to bless other people. You and I become the conduit of God's blessing. That, that is why one of, one of our key statements here at the church is that we are all about helping people encounter God, build community, and extend compassion. We want to get out and bless others because we have been so richly blessed by God. And, and God wants to use us to do that. But here's the issue. We cannot bless when our heart is a mess. Right? It's just, you know, James told us that. You, you, we cannot bless when our heart is a mess. So this morning, we want to learn how, how we can have some seasoned speech that will bless other people. And so we're, we're, I don't do it all the time, but we're going to use an acrostic um, to help us out with this this morning. So we're going to use the word bless. We're going to start out with the B. And we're going to, we're going to work through a passage in Colossians chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Colossians chapter 4. Um, it'll be up on the screens as well. And, and, and listen to what God says. He, he says this. Um, the first thing he wants us to do, the B, is he wants us to be prayerful. Okay? Be prayerful. That's, that's the B. In Colossians 2, 2 to 4, he says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. So he's going to share the gospel. He's saying, pray for me. Before we just share the gospel, we need to pray. I, I love the statement that I heard. You know, we want to talk to God about people before we talk to people about God. Right? And, and so we want to be asking God to give us open doors. We want to ask God to, you know, we want to be praying for people that, that God's spirit would, would move and that when the spirit moves that they would be open to that um, and receptive. But only God can make that happen. Now, he wants to partner with us. He wants to use your words, but only he can make the heart open and, and really accept those things. And so, you know, we want to make sure that God that we're being prayerful. And, and could you imagine if we were praying, if, if we're praying all the time and our hearts are centered around God and what he wants and his mission? His mission has always been to bless people. If we get on board with him and his mission, what will come out of our mouths? If we're spending time with him and we're getting on board with his mission to bless people, what's gonna come out of our mouth? Blessings. But if you just get up every morning and go, I gotta do my calendar, and we don't recognize that we've been blessed by God, if, the, if we're not filling our lives and recognizing our blessing, we won't bless other people. We'll be, we'll be harsh, mean, quick. We'll be, we'll be quick to speak and slow to listen. We'll say things that we shouldn't. We need to be prayerful. Like David prayer. this is a prayer that we've been praying every week through the series. In Psalms 1914, it says, May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. What if we just prayed that every morning? Lord, Lord, help me recognize my blessing and be a blessing to other people. Um, it's so important to pray. And another story, I, 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 sorry, hon, I didn't ask if I could share this one, but... Um, one time the, the girls were doing something else in the room, you know, and, and we, we, we understand your plight of those of you who have little ones. Because at one time, you know, we had like four of them that were getting kind of crazy. We even had four like teenagers all at one time. And <laughs> you're just like, you know, it's just, that's why I have no hair. Um, but the reality is, is there's one morning and they were, something was going on. And again, one of the very rare times, that's why probably I remember it, that, that Brenda got upset and um, she goes into the room and she's kind of in that mommy bear attacking mode kind of whatever thing going on. And, um, and our oldest daughter, Brianne, quickly sensed Brenda's like Ugh! anger, right? And as soon as Brenda started in and started saying something, um, Brianne says, stop, mommy, we need to pray. <laughs> right? 
we need to pray. Again, out of the mouth of babes, right? Folks, we need to pray. We, we need to be diligent to pray because as we center ourselves and understand God's blessing and we're thankful for it, as we're remembering the mission that God calls us to, that, that we have been blessed, then we will be people of blessing. But we need to pray. The second thing is, we, the L in bless is we need to live wisely. Live wisely. This is huge. In Colossians 4, 5, it says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Okay? And, and that's really huge. If we're going to be a blessing to the world, if we're going to help fulfill God's promise to Abraham that all the world will be blessed okay, through us, then we need to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders. Now, who's an outsider, right? Um, well, an outsider is anyone who's outside the faith. It's not somebody you just you don't know. It might be people that you do know. In fact, it probably is people that you know, people that, that are outside of faith, but they're inside your circle of influence. People that you're around all the time, but who still don't have faith in Jesus. And here's the thing. If they're close to you, but they don't know Jesus, they are watching. And they are listening. And... and and you want them to see the Jesus in you. The, the reality that I've discovered is this, is most non-Christian people that I get a chance to really talk to, they, they don't have a problem with Jesus. They have a problem with Christians. And it's usually something that Christians have said. It's not always even just something that Christians do. It's just something that Christians have said. Or maybe it's something that Christians have posted or tweeted I mean, people, that I, and I say this with all the love I can, stop. Stop with the negative and attacking postings, okay? I mean, the reality to that is, is it's making us all look bad. I can, I can make myself look stupid on my own, thank you very much. So I don't like it when I, I see things or I hear things or people will say, did you see that post? And I'm like, and when they say, I'm like, I don't want to look at another one because I know. And, and because people get riled up and people, people seem to react or they, 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 or they think that somehow they're going to right every wrong by responding to this one person's thing, Right? And, and this is so, it, it becomes so toxic. A, a simple rule that, that I have tried to follow in my life, um, and, and I'm thankful that I knew this before social media kind of hit, hit the stage, um, something that, that um, my dad um, was really, really great at, and something that, that he taught me was, was this easy statement. He says, praise in public. Praise in public. You know why you praise in public? Because it's great for other people to hear the praise. And here's the thing. If, if I go and I, and I say something to you and I praise you, that's really nice. And you're thankful and that's good. That's always really nice. But if I praise you in a place where other people hear it, you, your self-esteem gets jacked up like exponentially. Okay? Because it's like, oh, like, not only do you think that I'm okay, now all these people have heard that I'm okay. So I'm obviously exponentially more okay, right? Or more loved. So praise in public. Uh, use your platforms, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, your tweets, and all those things to praise, right? I, I, I love, like, I, when I get on there, I'm just like, man, that's, you know, someone's on post-service vacation. That looks great. That looks fun. That's awesome. God bless you. You know, I mean, it's like, find thing, ways to praise the good things that you see. But then, on the flip side, confront in private. Okay? Praise in public, confront in private. This is huge. It will change a lot of stuff, okay? Fight the urge to get mad at the post and think that you have to jump on there and say something, okay? 
If you really want to talk, message somebody and says, hey, can we talk? And then go have coffee and talk face to face and have a conversation, right? Folks, that, that is so important. And I know some people are like, oh, this is my platform. You know what? Your platform is not more important than getting the message to Jesus to people. Okay? If you're posting out of anger, bitterness, or the, or the felt need to confront, stop. Okay? Think. Right? Remember that your fingers as you're typing are as an extension of your tongue. Right? And when no one's right in front of you, it's a whole lot easier to just vomit on paper or on a post and then hit the little send button, right? Uh, That's why I try as much as possible to avoid, you know, people are like, oh, pastor, you know, you you know, I I just say, "I, I am not, you know what? That is not the place. That is not the place to, to do all the stuff. And in this season, Man, we all know there's just there's so much political junk out there and people getting angry with each other and people posting pictures of each other, you know? I mean, I literally saw a picture posted of somebody and somebody made this big thing. It's a picture of somebody and they they had a mask, they were just weren't wearing it correctly, and, and somebody just posted, you know, jerk. I'm like, what what? Like, you know, but that's that's what people do, okay? Fight those urges. Fight those urges, and, and, and let's stop, and, and let's think of ways that we can bless with our language. So always praise in public, confront in private. The, the next part, the E in the blessing, is, is again in verse 5 where it, it says there, it says, be wise in the way that you act towards, un, out, towards outsiders, and it says, make the most of every opportunity. I I guarantee you that if you will stop, ask God to help you see him, you have opportunities every day to engage with people, right? Most of us are just moving too fast. If any good thing has happened through all of kind of this crazy pandemic stuff, it's that certain things have gotten slowed down a bit. It takes a long time to go to the grocery store, Right now, when you when you have to be careful, I mean, I know things have loosened up a lot. You know, I had this wonderfully nice um, older lady one one time. I was in the store. I didn't know at that point that about the arrows on the ground that you could only go one direction. Right, so I just went for the stuff that I was going for. Right, Brenda told me I'm on a mission. I just go straight to the row. I'm grabbing the stuff, and this nice lady she came over and she said, um, "Hey." Um, I, I don't know if you saw, but there's these arrows on the thing. And I said, oh, I, I'm really sorry. And she, go, and she looked at me, and she's so sweet. She says, I, I just didn't want you to get in trouble. <laughs> and I thought, as usually in my life, too late, right? But, but then I love what she said next. I, I love the most. She goes, because I did. <laughs> right? And I thought, how nice, you know, she kind of got in trouble, and so she wants to make sure I'm okay, and I was like, you know, that that was just, that was just nice. But make the most of every opportunity. Um, I had a great opportunity, just happened to pop up yesterday as I was looking for something over at Smart and Final, guy comes in, and he's stocking shelves and stuff, and and, um, he's like, what are you doing with that? And and it was great, because I just said, oh, well, we have a meeting at our church, and da-da-da. And he kind of looked at me, and I said, well, do you, you know, do do you attend church anywhere? And he goes, and it was great. He just says, you know, I used to. And he says, I just kind of stopped going. And then, you know, he says, and I said, you know, I, hey, I know it's hard, you know, with all that's going on and everything else. And I said, but man, I said, if I can encourage you, you know, as we're struggling through all this, you, you need a place where, where, where people can love on you. You know, and it's just look for opportunities to just say anything and then let God take it from there. But we gotta be people who aren't afraid to engage. See, on one hand, we gotta be careful with what we say. On the second hand, we can't be afraid either to engage with people and to talk to people. The, one of the great lines that you can use right now for everybody is simply this. How are you doing through all this going on in our world. Now you gotta be careful, because boy, that's like, that's a big box they could open up, right? There's a whole lot that they could talk about. 
But it's an easy way to start conversation with people, engage with people. What's happened in our world is we are so isolated and so separated, and people are just looking for engagement. People just want to connect, and so engage. Um, the, the next thing, the, the S, the first S, because there's two, the first S is this, shower grace, okay? Shower grace. It says, in uh, Colossians 4, 6, it says, let your conversation always, uh, be always full of grace. Now, what does that mean? Is it just kind of like graciousness, you know, and things like that? Yeah, you know, yeah, I think it is. But, but it's more. It's more than that. It, it, it's, grace is more than just kind of being nice in the way that we say things, okay? It, it's supposed to be full of grace, not just a little bit of grace. We have to give people, especially outside people, we have to give them lots and lots and lots of grace. Jesus demonstrates this in his ministry so incredibly well. A story that many of us, if you've studied the Bible at all, you've probably heard the story of the woman that was caught in adultery. You know, it's a story where, you know, they're actually in the temple courts. So this would be like, you know, you're out there on the church patio, and, and, and the religious leaders, they, they drag in a woman who's been caught in adultery, right? Uh, and, and there's a lot that could go into that story that we're not going to go into right now because that, that part's not really the point. But, you know, and then you know the story, you know, that they're, they're asking, you know, Jesus, like, hey, you know, this lady got this caught in, a, in, in adultery. We, you know, the, the law says that we should stone her to death. And you know what? That, that is true. That's true. The, the law did say that. But then Jesus looks at all of them and he says, yeah, he, Jesus doesn't deny that the law says that. But he looks at all of them and what's he say? Let the one who is without sin cast the first stone, right? And, and then Jesus, it says this, you know, he bends down, he writes on the ground, and he says, Jesus straightened up and he asked the woman, okay, because all the people left, right? They just kind of, put their tails between their legs and kind of slithered away. And, and, and Jesus says this, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And listen to her words. No one, sir, she said. And then Jesus said this, he says, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. There's so much power in those short little statements. And I think the biggest thing right there, it, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. See, if anyone had the right to pass a judgment on her, it was Jesus. He eventually will be the judge right? If anyone had the right to judge, it was Jesus. If anyone could have, and by law should have, thrown the first stone, it was Jesus. If anyone could have lectured her a good lecture and set her straight and put her on a new path, it was Jesus. But he didn't use that opportunity. Because you know what she needed to hear first? She needed to hear first the words, I don't condemn you. He was full of grace. Full. He didn't just kind of give a little grace. He gave life-giving, life-preserving, life-building grace to this woman. That's what living full of grace, looks like. And that's what we need to be about. And then, once we've given grace, the last S is um, sprinkle salt, okay? You give, shower with grace, give tons of grace, sprinkle a little salt, right? Now, some of you really like salt, I get it, but this one says sprinkle it. Ha any of you ever, um, ever go into a restaurant 
and you know, some crazy person undid the, the salt thing and you tipped it and it went and the whole salt, anybody that ever happened to? I, I, I actually need to see your hands if, if that's ever happened to you that the salt shaker lid came off. Anybody, just raise your hand high, okay? Um, please forgive me. There was a time when I was a really stupid adolescent and thought that that was funny. And I realized this week while I was preparing that I've never asked for forgiveness for that. So for those of you, for all of the ones who I did get, and it might not have been you, but for you, please forgive me for that stupidity. But, but the, 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 the thing about this is this. We, we need just a little bit of salt. We all know if you put too much salt on, it kind of ruins things. So we need to just sprinkle the salt, okay? You need a little bit of it. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. There's a lot of sermon in there, but the reality is, is it's you are the salt of the earth. If the world's going to get salted, it's going to be from us. Now, why salt? Uh, I read a book a few years back called The History of Salt. It's really interesting. But obviously, one of the things that we know is salt is a preservative. Back then, without refrigeration, you salted everything. You know, they would salt meat, hang it out to dry. It would keep it preserved. But something as I was reading this book that I learned that was very interesting is this, is that your mouth, your tongue, okay, that we've been talking about has thousands and thousands of taste buds on them. One of the things that salt does, this is why, um, this is why a, a, a lot of restaurants, they, you know, they, they salt their food pretty good. It's because salt enlivens, kickstarts, kind of opens up the taste buds in your mouth so you can taste the other flavors better. And I think, I really like that aspect of salt when, when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. Because our role is to help open people up to the flavors of the world that God has created. And I, I see a lot of Christians with their words and with what they do, they shut people down. They close people's ears. They close people's minds to the truth of the gospel instead of opening them up. And it's usually just because we're not careful with what we say. So let's open up the world to the graciousness of the gospel. What I think it means to sprinkle with salt is that we bring Jesus into the conversation. We've got to bring Jesus in. So as you're having a conversation, make sure you bring Jesus into it. Um, I had a, a, a guy, uh, because Jesus is really the answer that they're looking for. I, I got an opportunity to um, speak at a men's retreat uh, a couple of years ago. And at the men's retreat, I had a young guy who came up to me and he says, hey, you know, at the break time, can we talk? And and I said, yeah, I'd love to. And so we went out and found a rock somewhere and we sat and we had a great conversation. And, and he said, hey, can I ask you a couple questions? I said, yeah. And he says, I, I've been thinking about this whole Christianity thing. And he says, and, and I got a couple questions and he, he rattled off a few. And I was like, okay, yeah, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm digging in the depths of all my theological knowledge. And uh, the last one he said, he, he says, now I got one more question. I said, okay, what, what's that? And he says, if I follow Jesus, do I have to stop smoking pot? Right? And I thought, okay, there, there, that's, that's, a real, that's a real question. You know? And I stopped in that moment, and I got to tell you, I prayed because I'm seeing kind of this desperation in this guy's eyes. That it's like he wants to accept Jesus. He's just, you know, somehow pot became the issue between him and Jesus. And I was like, I was like, Jesus, you've got to give me the answer for this, right? And um, and I said, um, you know, heck yeah, you got to give. It. No, I didn't say that. I said, here, here's the deal. I said, give your heart to Jesus and let him take care of that. Give your heart to Jesus and let him take care of that. Let's, not, let, let, let's remember that we have opportunities to change people's lives and introduce them to a Jesus that, 
doesn't condemn, that's full of love, that wants to draw people in. And then let Jesus deal with the hard issues, okay? Because folks, we, we need to be about helping people come to Jesus. I want to close with this illustration I heard that just really touched my heart. It's a story about a little girl who was in third grade. Her name was Mary. She knew growing up she was different from all the other kids. She had, she had a cleft palate, and, and she was the brunt of a lot of jokes because of it, and that was really, really difficult for her. She knew that she'd never really be like the other kids, and she constantly grew up with all kinds of teasing and things, and not only was she didn't, struggled with, with, with that, she, she also had a hearing impairment and stuff, and so she had trouble hearing. But her whole life changed in third grade when she was in Mrs. Leonard's class. Because back, back from what I understand, back in the 1950s, the way they used to give kids in, in school um, a hearing test um, every year. And the teachers would give the hearing test. And um, so what would usually happen is the, the student would come up and they would kind of turn their ear, you know, and they would have to plug one ear and the teacher would whisper something really quietly and then the student would have to repeat that back. And, um, uh, and so the, the students, you know, Mary's up there and, and, and it was her turn and usually the teacher would say something like, the sky is blue or something like that. And when it, when it came Mary's turn, she came up and, and the teacher just whispered quietly in her ear, I wish you were my little girl. And all the pains of all the teasings and all the other things seemed to disappear. And they became close friends over the years. And at Mrs. Leonard's funeral, Mary got up and said, I'm not sure I would be alive today if it weren't for the kindness and the kind words and the constant encouragement of Mrs. Leonard. See, folks, if, if you're here this morning and you, you're kind of far maybe from Jesus, I hope that what you will hear this morning is this. I hope you'll hear Jesus' voice whispering in your ear, I wish you were my child. If you're already a follower of Jesus, Jesus and there's a lot of stuff going on, there's words in your head, I, I hope you will hear the words from Jesus that says, I'm glad you are my child. And what would happen? What would happen if this week every single one of us would go out and make sure that people that didn't know Jesus knew that Jesus wishes they were his child? And what if we would go out this week and make sure that we used our words, our big, fat mouths to be a big fat blessing to the world if you're here this morning and you need to know more about Jesus I'd love to talk to you if you're here and you haven't been hearing that I want you to hear it again Jesus is saying I'm glad you're my child he was so glad he wanted to have a relationship with you so badly that Jesus gave his life and that's why we celebrate communion every week. Because it's a constant reminder. And, and maybe, I don't know, may, maybe my hope this morning is that maybe from now on, or, or, or maybe just sometime down the road when you're going to need it, or maybe you really need to hear this today, that every time you partake of the Lord's Supper, that you'll hear those words. I'm glad you're my child. And so let's together take the bread that represents Jesus' broken body that he gave for us so that we could be his children. Let's, let's take that together. And let's take the cup that represents Jesus' shed blood that helped us be adopted as his children. Let's take that together. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, 
We thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for the incredible gift of his love. Father, help us. Father, help us to, to slow down, to stop responding so quickly, to not respond out of fear and of anger, or of bitterness, of hurt. Father, let us be infused with your blessing and help our mouths to bless others. Father, help us to let people know that you want them, you want us to be your children. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.